<laughs> the views and opinions expressed on the nurses station are those of our hosts and guests. Not necessarily the views of Emory University, Danelle Hudson, Woodruff School of Nursing, or Emory Healthcare. Enjoy the show. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Nurses Station. Tim Cunningham here. And I think since our last episode, um, I, I was able to add a few extra words behind my title. So I'm the Vice President of Practice and Innovation here at Emory Healthcare. And I got another title and another hat that I wear to prevent the sunburn. I'm the Co-Chief Wellbeing Officer for the Woodruff Health Sciences Center, which means I get to work with Roughly 35,000 extraordinary people, I like to say, from valets to vascular surgeons, from anesthesiologists to zoologists, thinking about working with trying to figure out how do we improve well-being so we can be our best selves at work and more importantly, be our best selves when we go back home to be the best lovers, hospital, uh, hospitals, husbands, wives, partners, sisters, brothers, grandparents, pet owners, joggers, whatever we are, how do we think about well-being across the spectrum? And, and uh, you know, one way to do that is to check in with professionals within our profession, to learn from them, to talk about real-time, real issues, and uh, to see how we can constantly improve who we are and what we do. And that's what we do here at the Nurses Station, a place for real nurses to talk about real-time things in a real kind of sometimes fun way. And that's why I'm so excited to reconnect with you all. Carolyn Clevenger, Lexi Love, uh, Roxana Chikas, <laughs> Amor. Lexi, I do this every single time. When I see and I think about your name, I translate Amor to love because you're full of hey, love, Lexi you know, Amor. <laughs> I'm so full of love. You know, I can roll with it. It's good. <laughs> all right. Thank you for putting up with me and my hyper-caffeinated <laughs> chatting and check in. So before we jump into the topic today, I'd love to check in with you all. I miss you all. What's been going on? I what's know. new in your worlds? Lexi, what, what's on your plate nowadays? <laughs> it probably would be easier to discuss what's not on my plate because my plate is just overflowing with 5,000 different things, but I'm really just steaming, pushing forward with my research. I have this really cool R21 grant I just put in. New PhD students getting ready to start. Um, Kids growing up, I mean, everything's great. I'm just busy. Love it. I love I'm it. sure I love everybody it. else is feeling the same way. Just busy, 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 but happy. Lexi, your social media stresses me out because you're so also busy. Like all the stuff you're sharing there, I'm like, what a great life. I'm, I got social media jealousy of you. <laughs> don't be jealous. I, you know, I use social media as a way to kind of just, I don't know, just be positive and just, you know. It's, it's stressful. We all know social media is kind of like a highlight reel. So you're just putting it out there to put some positive energy in the world. And, you know, it kind of feeds back, you know, to me. So that's why I do it. I can teach you some tips, though. Please, I need all the help I can get. Uh, <laughs> and it, it's like, and, and we are, you know, in so many ways, we're coming back into this world. Pandemic is still happening. Folks say, I don't know if you offer this, people say things like post-pandemic, meaning after pandemic. And I'm like, post what? It's still happening. I, I like to call it peri-pandemic. Yeah. You got pre-pandemic before, you've got peri-pandemic during, and then post-pandemic, which I hope we'll get to. But uh, Dr. Roxana yeah. Chikas, as we're moving through this peri-pandemic stage, how you been doing? What's, what's new in your world? I'm good. So I want to share something. I have this hello. Do you know what it is? An elephant. <laughs> uh, a microbiome. <laughs> no. <laughs> It's not a micro? It's a, it's a kidney. Aww. So um, four weeks ago, I uh, became a living kidney donor. So I had my kidney removed and it was given to one of my professors, um, my advisor, uh, Dr. Vicki Hertzberg from the School of Nursing. And it's been a wonderful experience to know that I only had to be uncomfortable for about, I don't know, 10 days, like really uncomfortable. Uh, and that will give her, hopefully, 25 years more of life. Um, and I saw her today, and she is walking. She is uh, happy. Her creatinine is like 1.0. And I'm super oh, excited for her. And I, I think we're going to talk about this in, a, in the next ex uh, episode, but I'm hopeful that maybe someone out there will be inspired to be a uh, kidney donor. So aside from that, 
I've been. Uh, I mean, drop the microphone. <laughs> yeah, that is so beautiful. Wow. Yeah. Beautiful, so I gotta use it. I use it uh, in class now. You know, to, uh, to show my students that um, race is a social construct. Race is not a risk factor. And that, uh, you know, I'm Hispanic, she's a white woman. There's five people who volunteered and I was just her closest match. So I think that's pretty awesome. Shows how similar we are. Roxana, that is, we need to do a whole episode about that. I thank you. For, thank you for sharing that with, with us and with, with our audiences. Um, and I want to ask, producers are listening in, can we dig up some links for folks that might be interested in kidney donation? I bet there are a lot of people out there that maybe have thought of it. Um, and perhaps, you know, Roxana, you can inspire, like you said, some other folks to think about that. So let's say the nurse's station, let's share some links to connect people. Yeah. Um, yeah let me, can I share one story really quick? Yeah, um, please. I told my mom yesterday, I'm like, mom, I've lost three pounds since I had surgery. And she's like, I wonder if the kidney weighs three pounds. <laughs> I was like, Good point, right? <laughs> <laughs> Roxana, I got moms three questions. Keep for it you. real. <laughs> so, so for all the moms in the audience who might be wondering the same thing, but might be too embarrassed to ask, I, I need to ask you three quick questions, Roxana. Number one, how much does a kidney actually weigh? Oh, I, I'm not even sure. It probably weighs like a pound or something. Okay, but not three pounds, That's just it. to clarify, because I don't know, like sometimes I yeah. wake up in the morning and I'm feeling heavy down there, but it's not my kidneys. Okay, kidney does yeah. not weigh three pounds for, for clarity. Number two, Roxana, um, how, how, um, how did your nurses treat you? They were phenomenal. Uh, they were amazing, so kind, so nice, uh, so gentle, and... Um, the nurse who um, was going to be responsible for removing the catheter, I just loved her because as soon as they were doing, you know, shift change in their reporting, uh, I'm like, can you take the catheter out now? And she's like, well, I, I need to finish <laughs> doing shift change and get report on my other patients, but I'll be right back. And then I saw her outside because the door was a little bit open. And I'm like, are you ready to come take the catheter out? Because if you just give me the syringe, I could do it myself. <laughs> She's like, I'll be right back. <laughs> and so she did. She like within, I don't know, 20 minutes, she came back and um, we removed it together. <laughs> oh, that's, of course you did. Moment. That would have yeah. been hilarious if they just found you walking outside of the room with your catheter in hand be like, all right, so I'm going home now. Thanks for good care. Question well, number three, as... Roxana. Yeah. No, go ahead. Oh, I was ready to go home as soon as they removed it. Amazing. And that was quick. Like, yeah. I have a quick question for the science people, and especially for the, our audiences who are thinking of maybe going into nursing. You said a word. It's not an acronym, and we're not playing the acronym game today because I already lost and I, I'm giving up on that. But you said a word creatinine, and you said it's something like less than one. Can you tell us what well, you so meant? So normal, normal creatinine is typically 0 0.6 to 1.2 measures your kidney function, right? And so you want to stay within that range. And so Dr. Hertz for kidney function, uh, creatinine used to be sky high. Um, and so to be back in normal range with a new kidney is really amazing. And by the way, so I looked it up. A, a kidney is 160 grams. 160 grams. Yeah. That's a, a lot of uh, sugar. But not three pounds. Right. Roxana, you're, you're an inspiration. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that. Oof, I got chills. It's, it's so cool that you're a part of our team and, and, and that we can bring our minds together and, and connect and, and learn from each other, talk about what's important and dig deeper. So digging deeper, Carolyn Clevenger, it has been a long time. I feel like you and I work on stuff all together, all the time together at Emory, but we rarely see each other. So it's great to see you again. Tell us what's been going on in your world. Um, well, nothing as exciting as what Roxanne has been up to. So uh, that's a, a really tough um, story to follow. But uh, lots of things on my plate, too. I think like everybody else, we're staying busy. Um, our practice that I probably have mentioned before at Integrated Memory Care is growing in pretty exciting ways. 
we will start seeing our patients who are living with dementia in their senior living communities in a month. So this is our next new model of care. It's our next startup. We've been generously supported by a very helpful donor to get to this point. And um, we're at the fun part based on my definition, maybe the painful part based on our finance officer, which is that we have been bringing in new team members, registered nurses, nurse practitioners, a licensed practical nurse, a social worker, uh, and something called a dementia care assistant over the last month or so. And we have no new patients, so no revenue, only expense. <laughs> but that's okay. It's going to be fine. We're onboarding. We're just all kind of prepping for this big launch uh, in the next 30 days, doing all of the things we need to do for legal and compliance and contracts and so forth. So um, also been um, working on a couple of grants. I have a few that are uh, now fully um, recruited and uh, in pilot phase for dementia family caregivers. And then we found out recently we were awarded another really exciting uh, grant, which I cannot talk about just yet, but I will definitely talk about on a future episode. So we're excited for all the things we're going to get to do, not just for patients, but to support the nurses who take care of patients, which is also important. Um, on the rest of life is, you know, going well. We've got some new team members coming in over at the School of Nursing too. We're fully staffed again in all of those areas, like, you know, clinical placements, like, you know, no problem. Uh, clinical instructors, continuing education, lots of things happening at Emory Nursing Experience. So, um, you know, full plate, but delighted. And traveling again. Oh, my goodness. All of the strategy meetings, all the face-to-face -face two day brainstorming sessions that really should have happened two years ago or one year ago, we're all catching up. So I've just been on planes and less in the car and just seeing people that I've really missed, colleagues who have been like friends to me over the years. So lots of things happening, um, both at the office and away from the office. On jumping back in, jumping back up on the planes, jumping all over the the, the world, the planet, the, the country. Uh, so exciting, Carolyn. I got a quick question for you, and maybe this is a question for your financial people, so you can you can ask this for me. Is is starting a, a nurse run clinic like starting a winery? Meaning you buy a ton of land, you spend a lot of money on a big fancy building, you plant your vines, and then you gotta wait for forever for the vines to produce, and then you can finally start making money off your wine. That's similar? Okay, so I would say the first nurse run clinic that we opened, Integrated Memory Care Clinic, seven years ago was like that. And that was by a design. So we started slow, but we had to have the team available seven days a week in some capacity because we're primary care. We're not just a specialty consult. And I shouldn't say just, but we have to be available to people. And so, and we were really slow. We wanted to make sure workflows made sense, all of that. I will not launch a practice or another business like that uh, now that I have a little bit of experience behind me. So in this next uh, integrated memory care and community practice, we're building our interest list now. So the first day that we start, we have basically a list of people who've been waiting for the service. We've been partnering with marketing and we're so it truly is a launch, not just a slow open. So uh, no, we will not make money next month, though. I mean, if that answers that question. <laughs> But so we it's do not have a, a break-even projection. All right. Well, once you hit that break-even projection, call me and I'll buy you a bottle of wine from a vineyard that had to wait for like 10 years before they made money. And I hope it's Oh, fine. I would. I, I, yes. Anytime you may buy, buy me that bottle of wine. Right on. Well, um, it's again, it's so nice to see you all. I've only got one quick thing to share. And right as I share it, um, we're also going to take a little pause to 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 get a note from our sponsor. It's really cool that we've got sponsors now with the nurses station. Um, and so I'll share, we'll take a break for the sponsor, and then we're going to jump into the, uh, the topic today. And the reason I say sponsors, you might want to cut to the share now, because I've been learning cello over the last three months. So I'm going to try to play a cello what? song. And if it's, if it's really crappy, cut me off, and then we'll go to a break from the sponsor. But this is the first time I've played live in front of people before. I might poop my pants a little bit. Let's see what happens. That's not you playing. Yeah, it is. There's no way. So it goes on really like that. You want to hear my... Yeah. Do you want to hear my wait favorite minute, part? Here. No, wait a minute. No, Tim, that, is that you really Here, playing? Here, check it out. I think That's it really, really is. Really me playing. 
You want to hear my favorite part of this song? It goes like this. Oh, that's not, wait, let me try this again. Uh, oh, now I'm so nervous. Oh my gosh. I'm so impressed. And then it goes on and on and on. And then if there's one part, it goes, wait, no, it goes this way. No, it goes this way. Wait. This is the end. <laughs> now we'll take a break. If we get picked up, if we get picked up for another season, at the end of the next season, I'll play that whole song and it won't sound nearly as crappy. No, wait, so, I have to say one thing. I know we're going to break. I swear I was on Bridgerton for a second. We need to do the nurse's station Bridgerton style. That was ooh. excellent. I think we're oh, gonna I have to be so more specific ideas. about what we mean by Bridgerton style. Yeah, no, can we dress up and then like, oh, we could, we could, that's exciting. We'll we could we could have some that. more um was great. we could have more organ organ stuffed animals Bridgerton style plain cello yes, excellent excellent that was great Tim amazing love it now a word from our sponsors hey guys did you know that being a loyal follower of the nurses station can also get you continuing education credit through Emory Nursing Experience nurses around the globe have access to evidence based coursework developed by Emory's world-class nurse faculty, designed to not only help you with license renewal requirements, but also further your career with various certifications and to help you continue to provide the best high-quality patient care. Log on to nursing.emory.edu slash E-N-E for details. Welcome back, everybody. Welcome back to the Nurses Station, where we have real nurses talking in real time about real stuff that is affecting us, it's affecting our practices, it's affecting our profession. And just a reminder, you can listen to The Nurses Station anywhere you get podcasts. You can also watch The Nurses Station on the uh, Emory Nursing School website. You can watch the video cast, but take a listen, share this stuff with you, respond to us, send us your feedback, let us know what you're learning and, 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 and what excites you and also what you hear and you're like, hmm, let's dig a little bit deeper because that doesn't quite make sense to me. Um, something that we want to talk about today is pretty serious, and, and I've been scratching my head a lot since this came out in the news because this doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Now, full, full disclosure, none of us on this, uh, this webcast are lawyers. We're not legal professionals. We've all had experiences with things related to the law, for sure, but just to be clear, none of us are lawyers, and, and the opinions that we share are our own. Um, so we're going to talk about the recent uh, case in the news about former nurse Ron Redonda Vaught. And she was recently criminally prosecuted for a drug error that, that, that she, she was a part of. I'm gonna say she was a part of because there were a lot of factors that led to this error, but that error ended up in the death of a patient. And I think what makes this both frightening and interesting and something that we need to talk about in this profession is that Ms. Vaught, was recently convicted of gross neglect of an impaired adult. So the patient was not fully with it. That's what impaired adult means. Um, but Ms. Vaught was, was uh, charged with homicide. And I don't think that's ever happened to a nurse before. So y'all, I don't know how you've been feeling about this, but this has kept me up at night when I think about both my own practice as a nurse, as a clinical nurse, when I think about the 7,000 nurses that I am accountable for here at Emory Healthcare and supporting their professional development and education and well-being. And so I've been staying up at night thinking, how do we best support our nurses and our teams? And also, how do we advocate for, for people like Redonda Vaught and other people who may have been perhaps unfairly charged for something that they took part in, but is it really their fault? 
Um, so I got a couple questions for you all, but the first question I want to ask the whole group, when you all were practicing in your clinical practices, raise your hand if you ever made a medication error. And I'm not going to ask you to talk about details, but I can say I've made a couple, maybe more than a couple. And honestly, as an emergency nurse, I may have made error, may have made errors that I didn't even know about because sometimes patients come through so fast in our emergency departments, we get them up into the ICU or to the other floor. I may not even know. Um, but thank you all for for sharing a little solidarity here and 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 knowing that we've all made mistakes before. Does anybody want to talk a little bit about? your experience in making a medic medication error, error? Um, and then we'll, we'll move forward to some other questions. I can think of so yeah, many times. Oh, I'm go sorry. Ahead, go ahead. I'll go next. I'll go next. Go ahead. Okay. I can think of so many times. And, and so now in my role, I'm more likely to be prescribing and I made errors there too. But um, I was giving medications with a nursing student. And I think that um, comes to mind in this case because, as I understand it, Nurse Vaught also had a trainee with her the day that she was um, in this case. And so, um, you know, when you have a student and you're giving medications, you probably go through every single one of the steps of the process by the book. So if there was any time that I was going to be following exact procedure because I'm having to do it and explain it and model for this first semester student, we're in a long-term acute care unit. We gave medications, and then we found out as we went to chart them in the medication administration record for the MAR. 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 It had been discontinued. It had been discontinued. I think it was a potassium that we were given. It was discontinued that morning for a high potassium level on morning labs. But that doesn't happen in real time. It's not like you have some alert. There's no system by the bedside that tells you that. And the um, medications were in drawers. So it's not an electronic um, process. It wasn't then at that place. And that's an LTAC, a little different than your usual like inpatient hospital. So um, yeah, we had to then, do then I got to teach the student how to document medication errors. And we got to talk about safety as a system property, which I think we're gonna spend some more time talking about today, but I'll let Lexi share hers as well before I jump into that. Yeah, my, mine was similar. It was the same thing as a um, nurse midwife sending over our e prescription. You know how you click in the system and you send it over to the pharmacy. And it was similar to this uh, nurse vault case in the sense that I clicked the medication that was similar to what I was trying to send, but it wasn't what I was supposed to. And the pharmacist called and said, and this is a pregnant patient. And it would, you know, fortunately, it wasn't the type of drug that even if she had a taken would have caused an issue, but it was the same exact thing where. It was just right next in line to the thing that I wanted to click in the e-prescribe. Um, but the pharmacist called me back. And I remember just having this feeling of just freaking out, like, oh, my God, like, what if the pharmacist didn't catch that? And then this patient had taken it. And luckily, like you said, it wasn't one, you know, that was going to harm the patient, but it was something that she didn't need. Right. So it was that exact same situation. And I was I remember that particular day. I was just really busy in the office, had a lot of people on my schedule, just moving really fast, trying to keep up with everything I was trying to do. And it was just an honest mistake. And so just to think about someone being charged with a homicide, and I'm not trying to take away from the family and their loss of their loved one. I want to make sure that I say that, but I can understand how it can happen, especially with so many things we have to do as nurses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I hear you, Lexi, on on being so busy, all the things we have to do at nurses. Carolyn, hearing you on on the complexities of an electronic medical record and new technologies coming in that can lead to confusion. Um, so I'm already hearing a lot of factors that have led to mistakes that we've made. Um, Roxanne, anything that you you feel safe sharing or care to share? I don't want to put you on the spot. Yeah. I'll put myself on the spot next, though. No, no, yeah. So um I used to work at a pediatrician's office, and one day I was training another nurse, um, and I'm sorry, it was not a nurse, it was a medical assistant uh, to give vaccines. And she had already been on the job for a week or something, and in pediatrics, you give lots of vaccines because there's so many babies that come in. And um, I was training her, and she needed to give a patient an an MMR, chicken pox, the combo, and I think the flu vaccine. And she, I was busy also trying to help someone else. 
And so she started drawing up the vaccines and, um, you know, I thought that she had been on the job for like a week or something that she was doing the six rights of medication, right? So identify the right patient, the right medication, the indication for use, the right dose, right time, right route. And, um, and she ended up giving this uh, uh, patient uh, the combo MMR uh, chickenpox vaccine and another MMR vaccine. And out of all the vaccines, <laughs> that M double dose of the MMR has, you know, MMR has lots of controversies, whether it causes autism or not, which it does not, but parents are still concerned about that. And so I had to, you know, kind of, we, we had to tell the doctor, we had to tell, I had to talk to the mom and hopefully, you know, the mom wasn't too, too upset, but, uh, you know, she let us have it and, you know, we, but it was part, you know, part of the uh, kind of the system that I was working in and that many of us nurses work in where we get really busy and our attention is needed so in so many different places that we spread ourselves thin mm -hmm. and we're not able to provide, you know, uh, that oversight that sometimes is needed. And um, also, you know, there wasn't really a uh, system in place, right, to, that, that could help you catch up, um, uh, catch a mistake. It was just pulling from the the, the freezer, the refrigerator, and um, so I, I think that you know it wasn't done on purpose. And uh, when mistakes happen, I I you know the most the thing that most concerns me about this case, and just thinking about students and someone who's contemplating becoming a nurse is that it might scare them away. Um, and in nursing school, I remember every time uh, you know being told, you know, if you make a mistake say it so that we can correct it and find a way to foolproof it. You're not gonna get in trouble. And uh, I think that this nurse, Rhonda Vaught, you know, was very courageous in coming up, uh, being truthful about what had happened. And she is um, now uh, charged with uh, negligent homicide. And I think that's it's just a, awful for the profession for uh, this, this a tragedy overall. I agree. And Roxana, thank you. Yeah. Thank you for sharing your experience. And I love the point that you brought up in pointing out that Redonda Vaught, after she made the mistake, um, she reported it. She reached out to people. She asked for help. She said, this is what I did. This is what happened. And I recently was a part of a talk earlier today where I learned for the first time that when this happened, the hospital and health system that Redonda Vaught worked for did not report it. And it actually went for days, if not weeks, if not months. I don't have the exact time period, but the nurse who pushed that medication and said, ooh, I did something wrong. We need to address this right now, addressed it right now. And that's what we're taught as nurses. If we make a mistake, we ask for help. We work together, work through it. And I, I do want to point out that what I've learned on the record is that this health system did not report it right away. Um, and transparency is so key with this work. Uh, for our listening audience, I apologize. When I started this, I said, hey, raise your hand if you've ever made a med error. And I didn't say to the listening audience, if, if, if you're not able to see or if you're not watching the, the webcast, all of us raised our hands, which is to show that we've all made mistakes as nurses. I've made a couple that I want to talk about really briefly, but I want to focus on, on this case of Redonda Vaught. I mean, one mistake, Roxana, that I made that makes me, it resonates with, with something that you talked about with the vaccine. When the pandemic first hit, I was asked to help stand up um, our vaccine clinic here. And part of my job as a nurse educator was to educate uh, nurses who were licensed to give injections, but maybe some of them haven't given an injection a long time. I was rushed as, as I get excited on the show and I talk really fast. I did a lot of very rapid education for many people who are going to give intramuscular in injections. And unfortunately, I assumed that one of the nurses I was educating was much more competent in giving the injection than they actually were. And they ended up giving an injection in the wrong place in the arm, which caused uh, this person a lot of pain. We did a follow-up, we reported it, we did a follow-up, the person's okay. Um, but I realized that that's my fault as a nurse mm -hmm. educator, because it was my accountability for providing adequate education and getting that feedback from the nurse to make sure they were safe. And if I didn't 
feel they were safe, it should have been my job as a leader to say, I don't want you to give any injections until we're ready. So that's, that's a medication error that I made just, you know, a couple years ago. Another one that I made was as a pediatric nurse, we had a child who came in undergoing CPR and I was in charge of setting the pumps um, with medications that you give to someone who's undergoing CPR. Um, and in my haste and hurry and stress, because here's a child that is not alive that we're trying to save their lives, I gave them too much medicine in the pump. Um, unfortunately, the child passed. The child did not pass from that error. Um, and when we reviewed the case, we realized that the child was likely to die anyways because of other factors. But I remember for weeks and months, I lost sleep over that thinking, was that my fault? Um, it's important to talk about this. It's important to acknowledge this. And, and it's important to ask for help, which Redonda Vaught, it seems like, and everything that I've read and learned, did. And yet, she was still convicted of a murder. So let's, let's parse this out a little bit. From you all's experience, you know, you mentioned busyness, you mentioned systems, you mentioned um, experience or lack thereof and assumptions. What are some things that you all have learned about this case that you would want to share yeah. for others so that we can continue to stay in a sense of solidarity as nurses? And Roxana, as you mentioned, we don't want to scare anyone off from this profession because it's still the best friggin' profession on the planet because we have the opportunity to talk about this and become stronger together. So what are some things that you all saw in this case that we need to elevate and bring to light? Well, I just wanna point out that all four of us raised our hands about making medication errors. And we're not the only four nurses who've made med errors. I mean, I guess five, right? This is not rare. This is so common that the um, number of fatalities per encounter for encountering healthcare from medication, from medical, not just medication, other ways that patients are harmed through errors um, is more common than dying while bungee jumping per encounter. There are people who are afraid to fly on airlines because they're concerned about safety. Healthcare is much more dangerous than that. So um, I think that's sort of important for us to remember this is not rare. I, I think about uh, medication errors and medical errors in the same way that we talked about burnout. This is a systems property. And we can't, so to focus on the individual factors, I think is a really dangerous approach to take. You know, in this case, we've talked about technology. We've talked about um, in, in safety, let me also full disclosure. So I did have a period of time in my career during which I was a faculty in a postdoctoral fellowship in the Department of Veterans Affairs, which is Advanced Quality and Safety Fellowship. And we trained uh, nurses and physicians and other health professionals postdoctorate on quality and safety. So part of that curriculum will tell you that there are um, multiple levels of um, stops that sort of should intervene, right? There are sort of your soft reminders where you get those alerts like, oh, hey, this, is a, uh, this medication interacts with this medication when you're prescribing, or maybe like a sign or something like that. There are sort of your uh, moderate length, uh, moderate where you have to maybe do an extra click or another um, nurse has to sign off on like a dose of insulin, for example. And then you have your hard stops, which is usually going to happen with equipment. So like a, a pump or a patient controlled analgesia, analgesia. I, can't, I need PCA. I need the acronym to say that word, um, you know, where you have more of a hard stop because it's such a high risk scenario and equipment can actually prevent you from doing things wrong. So, you know. Um, you know, there's so many layers between um, harm actually reaching a patient from, you know, where things begin. And each of those layers have, um, are not foolproof. Uh, you, people may hear about like the Swiss cheese, right? It's like lines of Swiss cheese. Every slice of cheese has holes. And when those holes line up just perfectly, harm completely reaches the patient. And those holes are varying sizes depending on what we put in place. So, um, you know, we had a technology issue where um, technology programs were being changed over. The, I think the lock, the electronic lockbox for drugs was not communicating with the medical record or with the pharmacy. Um, there is just this need sometimes to override those things so that your patient gets the medicine that they need when they need it. So this patient was in the radiology suite, as I understand it, about to have a procedure. You certainly want to make sure that they have sedation for that procedure so that they don't harm themselves and so that they are not additionally distressed. Um, and so you override systems to get things done. 
Um, and then, of course, there are other things around being in a unit that's not your own, working with the trainee we've talked about. Um, and then, you know, what I had read, at least in one instance, that some of those gaps in the um, safe, safety of medication administration had been reported and had not yet been resolved. And so those are sort of the other things that I that I see. And I know we've talked about being in a health system that maintains transparency and does reporting the way that they're supposed to do. There's also for you, the individual nurse working in a system that responds to your concerns in a way that you know, actually resolves the problem to make you more safe at work. No one wants, no one goes to work as a nurse to say, how, who can I hurt today, right? We go into this profession to help people. And you know what many of us have, have talked about, about you losing sleep, Tim, that's that, that's the side that we don't hear. So, you know, people aren't necessarily um, going to court for criminal cases, but they do have their own um, suffering and distress as a result of these errors, whether or not someone was harmed. And we're not really talking about that much at all. Yeah, not at all. And and it sounds like, Carolyn, you know, that that safety to be able to to admit something, to ask for help, to to say, I'm not sure what's going on. Um, you know, a lot of folks call that psychological safety. And and I'm wondering from y'all's experience, I guess two things. Have you worked in places where you felt psychological safety? Or if yeah, what's that like? Or if not, what would you need as a clinician and a nurse to feel that sort of psychological safety where if something bad is about to happen, you can say, stop, let's fix this. Or if you or someone on your team makes a mistake, can you be safe enough to say, oh, wow, let's, we need to readjust right now. Like, what does that look like to you all, psychological safety? Well, I'll speak to that a little bit. I think that most nurses right now in a general hospital setting are not feeling the safety. I think they're feeling um, like more and more and more is put on them. And I think the question we have to start asking is, what is the role of the nurse in the modern healthcare setting? It started off one way, um, and now with technology, as Carolyn has mentioned, we have sicker populations coming in, a more diverse population coming in. All of these things are coming in, and the nurse is put at the crux of that and expected to carry all of that. And then when, um, as we see in this case, when accidents happen, she was kind of left out there um, as if she was an individual operating outside of that healthcare system. And I think that's the, the feeling of a lot of nurses. Um, and that, you know, I felt that somewhat when I worked in a hospital setting. Now, I work now currently as a clinician at the Atlanta Birth Center, and I can say for that environment, the, the thing that makes it feel safe to me is that there are very clear protocols on how to manage certain conditions. There are safety checks. There are backup. You know, if I get into a situation, I feel like I need help. I know who to call. Um, all those things are very clear and transparent. And I would say that in order for nurses to feel that in a hospital setting, those protocols and those policies need to be really clearly delineated. Do nurses know what to do if they have a medication error? Do they know who to go to? Are they going to feel like they're going to be protected? Or are they going to feel like, if I report this, I'm going to go to jail? You know, And so I think um, we keep circling back to this concept of transparency. There has to be transparency and there has to be a reciprocal, I care about you. You work for me as a nurse. I care about you as an employer. And I don't think that nurses are getting that. We're, we're driven, we're just worked to death. We're expected to carry all of this weight and then there's no support. Um, a, a, a gift card here or there, or uh, I'll pay you double time to come in to work. Those are not, that, that's not caring for nurses. And what you're seeing, again, is burnout. You're seeing nurses just leave the profession in droves. You're going to see our profession disappear because nobody's going to sign up to continue to take on more and more and more and more. So we as a healthcare system and leadership team, I know you're a leader, we have got to come up with innovative ways to help nurses. In this case, maybe we need to have a whole, just medication team. Take medications off of nurses, right? Have the pharmacist train up pharmacy techs or whoever that specializes in medications, and they come give the medications to the patients. You know, we have to start offloading all of the responsibilities that are placed on nurses. I know that was a long answer. Yeah. I get, I could say a lot more, um, but it's it's time to stop this, or we're going to see yeah. our profession uh, decrease. 
I agree, Lexi. And it's time for long answers. I love that long answer. Thank you for sharing that. One thing that, that you reminded me of, and then Roxanne, I've got a question for you. There's some research, pretty recent, from um, Ohio State, a researcher named Bern Melnick and team has found that also when nurses work a 12-hour shift, the last four hours of that shift from hour eight to hour 12, those are the most dangerous times for a nurse to be practicing. Makes sense because they're exhausted, because they've already worked eight hours straight. And Lexi, as you're pointing out, in nowadays with more technology and sicker patients, we've got a lot of distractions. So I, I love what you shared. Thank you. And we do need to work in innovation. And as a leader, I'd love to, to follow up with some of these thoughts, to share some things we're doing at Emory. Um, but we still have a long, long way to go. Before I do that, I've got a question for you, Roxana. Um, should someone who is thinking about becoming a nurse, or maybe someone who's in nursing school right now, should they be afraid? And should they think about doing something else? Is it is it dangerous or too dangerous to be a nurse right now? Well, I don't I don't think it's too dangerous to be a nurse. I think there's an inherent risk, right? Uh, which there is with many professions, but I think that um, what what uh, nursing students can do and those who are thinking to become nurses is really arm themselves with knowledge and know uh, you know be advocates, fierce advocates, and and report when you see something wrong when there's a malfunction with technology uh, to leadership and uh, hold them accountable. I, and I think the youth of today is starting to hold. Um, leadership more accountable than than before and uh, so I'm I'm very hopeful for the future of the nursing workforce and um, I, th I think that you know Rhonda she is being used uh, in a in a system that's very powerful and complicit just to, to punish her and make her an example but yet I haven't seen any indictments uh, against you know the other the other part of the healthcare team that was taking care of this um, this patient, and um, that makes you you know that raises eyebrows. Why why isn't every you know other people being investigated as well? And shows you how how powerful the system can be. Yeah. Roxana, um, that's that's such a poignant point, and I think in what we're not hearing. It's really important for us to, to listen to. Team, uh, this was real. This was heavy. And it's a reminder that uh, we got a lot of work to do. We've got work to do as leaders. We've got work to do as learners. We've got work to do as professors and mentors. And we will continue to move through this. We will continue to move through it together. We'll keep asking those hard questions. And uh, we'll keep keeping nurse as the best profession on this planet. So thank you all for your thoughts today. Listeners and watchers and fo folks engaging, please follow us on the socials. If you've got thoughts, if you've got comments, if you've got critiques, send them to us. We read that feedback. We might bring some of that onto the show to talk about it because your voices matter and your voices are important. One of my favorite books, it's called The Book of Joy. It's interviews between uh, His Holiness the Dalai Lama and Archbishop Desmond Tutu. There's a line in the book that says, wisdom is like water. Both can be found in the lowest places. Wisdom is like water. Both can be found in the lowest places. So it doesn't matter if you're a professor or like a, a like nurse who's been a nurse for 20,000 years. You might be a high school student interested in nursing, and you might have the best idea out there. Wisdom can be found anywhere. So share your wisdom with us. Like us. Follow us. Let us know what you think. And we look forward to connecting with you next time when we talk about another heavy topic in real time with real nurses. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. We're grateful you're a part of the Nurses Station.